Welcome back to A Fresh Story, the podcast where we have conversations about brave decisions to start over again. I'm Jenny. And I'm Olivia. And we're so glad you're here today. Hello, 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 sister. How are you? I am doing very well. I had such a good lunch today. Do you want to hear about it? I do always want to hear. Our, re- our readers, our listeners always want to hear. Our readers want to hear about it too, but they're they're going to keep waiting. because. Um, so there's this thing here called tiger bread, which I think is like a Danish bread. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to describe it other than sort of like an overly cakey white bread, and I really love it. Um, and I bought some from the grocery store pre-sliced, and it's like these thick slices of bread. I had one piece that I did butter and honey on um, with salami. Mm. And then on the other piece, I did goat cheese with some black olives. And like, I really like to make myself like two small sandwiches. I'm laughing because I was just watching the Will and Grace episode where where Stan dies and in his will he gives his like salami room like and then he like breaks it he really like, he, he like you know why and then like Will keeps going and the, reading the will and he's like and your jams and your jellies and like he goes the chutneys to the Chinese right, food delivery yeah, guy oh my god it, the whole that was amazing so that's why salami made Olivia me laugh. and I are both watching rewatching we're both will watching Will and Grace which maybe we'll have to do a whole episode on that <laughs> Will and Grace sister I episode. Mean, It would be, it would make sense given like my history with Will and Grace, right? Yeah. And also there was a lot of fresh starts in that show. Maybe maybe we should Mm -hmm. do that. A fresh starts in Will and Grace episode. Okay. Anyway, that is not what this topic was. Uh, We had a wonderful Twitter friend come on the show. The lovely ray of sunshine, Ashley Mason, Mm -hmm. who is a twin. And... I, well, she's. I had no was, idea. I didn't either. I didn't. She's actually one of four well, girls. End of the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But you know, we talked about a couple different, really, really heavy things on this episode, which was getting out of a toxic relationship, yeah. and also being a young woman, um, dealing with a mother who's dying, and how you physically, emotionally, mentally prepare yourself for that. And so, um. Ashley is so sweet, so lovely, just so open to sharing her story, and we thank her for that. So mm-hmm. please enjoy the episode with Ashley, and please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to a fresh story so that we can keep telling fresh start stories. <music> Ashley Mason is the founder of Dash of Social, a content marketing firm specializing in social media, marketing strategy, blogging, and email marketing. Working closely with their clients, Ashley and her team help small business owners and entrepreneurs craft and execute value-driven marketing strategies designed to establish thought leadership, grow online communities, and build connections and leads. Additionally, Ashley founded the Massachusetts Business Network in 2022, which is the only statewide publication that provides free to low-cost resources that support organizations with increasing their visibility and establishing thought leadership through its podcast, blog, and directory. When she isn't working, you can find her running on her Peloton or curled up on the couch with a book. And I'm going to say... I am a huge fan of Ashley's book, Picks. I save every <laughs> single one of your Instagram posts and stories because we have a very similar reading uh, habit of type of books. Um, but Ashley, I I feel like we've interacted on Twitter for a very long time. And we've had a couple of phone calls. But I know you have some good stories inside of you. And I'm very excited to have you here today. I am very excited to be here. And it makes me laugh that you mentioned um, saving my book pictures because just last week, someone sent me a screenshot from 2018. And they're like, I've been saving your book recommendations since 2018. You do. You have the best compliment ever. (laughs) Oh, great. You have amazing recommendations. And I always like, I mean, I know you, I think you're on Goodreads, right? You do have a Goodreads? Yeah. So I do follow you over there too, but maybe a book blog is in your future also. Yes, I agree with you. (laughs) How are you doing today on this? I think it's a rainy day on the East Coast. Is that right? It is. I'm good. How are you guys? We're good. We're good. We're We're super happy to chat with you. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, we're good. Um, Why don't you take us back to the beginning of your Fresh Start story? Absolutely. So my story really began back when I was 14. I was a freshman in high school when I had met my then boyfriend, now ex-boyfriend, three years into my freshman year, or three weeks into my freshman year. So with this relationship, of course, it's my first real relationship. I'm very exciting, excited. I went to a Catholic high school where I didn't really know many people, maybe like five people from my town that also went there. So the idea of having a football player who is interested in me 
and kind of viewing me as someone who could be interesting to him um, kind of enamored me from the start. Very early on into that relationship, I'd say that there were definitely toxic capabilities or characteristics that came up, but I always brushed it off because of the fact that he had grown up in a very unstable home and living environment when he was younger. And so I kind of used that as an excuse to kind of write off ultimately his actions. And so it got to the point where through high school and even into the first few years of college, I was just always dealing with these really difficult situations where it was ultimately a power trip on his end where he would constantly try to break up with me, not because he actually wanted to, but because he could hold that over me, hold that control over me, constantly accusing me of cheating on him, uh, being jealous. He actually went through my phone and deleted every single guy's contact in my phone, like all of this stuff uh, that just ultimately got too much. But I feel like for me personally, when I was going through it, like I was ultimately mentally broken up with him, but not actually. It got to that point where it's like I just couldn't do it because I was going through a lot personally. During the freshman year of college for me, my mom was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, which is called glioblastoma. And so I remember one thing that really stood out to me then is that you'd think you turned to your boyfriend of four to five plus years at that point for support. But the night before her 11 hour brain surgery, I'm with my cousins and my sisters trying to watch like the Grammys or Emmys or something like that, having a girl's night. And I'm texting him in the corner crying because he's trying to break up with me 11 right before my mom's surgery. So that kind of stood out to me where I was like, okay, something is not right here. Um, And then eventually what ended up happening was after probably two years of going through this ridiculous relationship and really being I would say emotionally and verbally abused in that sense. Um, I kind of had this aha moment where we found out when only my mom had a few months left to live that I was like, something has to change. And that was it. And that was my fresh start. I broke up with him. And then my mom passed away three months later, unfortunately. But it was like I kind of had that nudge that I finally needed to just do it. And I feel like I haven't really looked back since. I haven't even thought about it, really. I just kind of did it. And then, boom, I went on with my life. Wow, that's a lot for for a young woman to explore. What was it? So take us take us back, right? So you grew up in Massachusetts? Yes. And you went to a Catholic high school. So what was that like? You met him at the high school? I did. Okay. And so you were together. I'm just trying to put the timeline. So you were together for all of high school? Yeah, so basically freshman year of high school through like almost end of junior year of college. So just shy wow. of seven years. So it was a long time. It's a long time. That's a long time. Yeah. That's like a big part of your growing up, right, mm-hmm. as a woman and, and experiencing the world and all of that stuff. So what what was it that started to kind of give you that like intuitive pull that like this is not right and I deserve more than this? Oh, yeah. So I'd say definitely what happened with – the night before my mom's surgery, that was like the really big kicker. I mean, there were so many other things that happened before then, but I was like, I'm going through this very traumatic experience and you should be here for me, comforting me. But instead, I'm trying to beg you not to break up with me the night before this is happening. So that really kind of kicked it off. I also had this understanding where probably when I was around 20 years old, I had this realization where I was like, I never want to marry this guy. Like I knew I would never marry him. Or if he were to ever propose, I'd absolutely say no. And so it kind of got to the point where I was like, if I don't see myself with this person long term, like why am I even in a relationship with him? I also was, I guess, ashamed to talk about him to my family, to my friends. I was very hush hush about it. Two of my closest and best friends right now never even asked me about him in college because they're like, we just weren't even sure what was going on. And you never just came out and like talked about anything. You just kept it to yourself. And so with my fiance now, it's like, I feel like I'm always talking about him, always saying, oh, Jeremy did this. Jeremy said that. Like, I'm so excited to tell people about that type of stuff. And so with my now ex, it was like I had that realization was I should be excited and wanting to tell people about what's going on in my relationship. But instead, I'm embarrassed and really holding it to myself. What was going on around you, like with your girlfriends in high school? Were they like, I'm thinking modeling wise, right? Like, did did this feel normal? Did it feel like this was happening with other people? Or is there an element, like you said, of sort of like a shame of like not wanting to talk about it because they were in different kinds of relationships? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So in high school itself, I kept it a secret because he was like the type of person who everyone loved him because he was so personable. He made everyone laugh. He was involved in so many sports. He had a bunch of friends. And so no one knew about what I was going through. And I didn't be the one I didn't want to be the one to say actually, this is happening behind the scenes that no one even knows about. And so I didn't talk about it in that sense because my friends loved him only because they saw that public facing side of him. And so fortunately, I've grown up around very stable, loving, supportive people. And so they themselves weren't going through anything like that. But I felt like it was kind of a me problem, something must be wrong with me, or I must be doing something wrong to be going through this. And so I kept it very private because I felt like it was ultimately my fault why I was getting treated that way. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a big burden to carry, right? Especially as you become a woman and you go through that. So when you decided to kind of extricate yourself from this relationship, uh, what was some of the, what were some of the ways and tools and strategies that you used? So I feel like it's almost weird to talk about this now, but I almost just did it cold turkey. Like, I feel like I was just at the point in the relationship where, like I mentioned, I was probably like mentally broken up with him for two years at that point, but was just going through so much at the time that I just needed someone to be there. And so when it came time for me to be like, okay, this is it. Like, I don't see any moving forward with this. I kind of just did it cold turkey and then move forward. Like, I think about this all the time, how when I, when we broke up, like I didn't even cry (laughs) and I still haven't cried. I think it was just at the point where I was over it and I knew I deserved better. I also think that what helped was that there was kind of two fresh starts in that sense where Uh, Three months after breaking up with him, my mom did pass away. So that was like a whole new beginning that I had to navigate through. And so I kind of just went through those very difficult experiences simultaneously. I did throw myself into my work uh, with what I do with my business. I feel like I've used and still use my business as a coping mechanism for grief. If I just constantly fill my time with stuff to do, I don't have time to think about the, the sad thoughts or the difficult things. I also was really grateful to have had Uh, and still have that close group of friends who are like, what can we do for you? Let's go to the beach this weekend. Let's go to this fun restaurant, always coming up with plans to kind of keep my mind off things. And so I feel like that really helped. Simultaneously, I did end up meeting my now fiance about a month and a half after my mom passed away. So probably about four months after my previous relationship. And I don't want to say that I leaned on him because I didn't, but I feel like at that time he was like the missing puzzle piece. It was kind of like, oh my gosh, my mom sent this person for me. And I felt like it came at the perfect time to get through and navigate the difficulties and help me find my footing in this individual person that I am now. I love that. I wonder, I think that high school relationships aren't really taken so seriously And I feel like there is a real abuse that can happen at that age. And I just wonder if you would want to speak to that for a minute, like about the very real abuse that can happen when we don't really like, you know, I think if you're like 15, you go to your mom and you're like, oh, this is happening. I I don't know if all moms would take that relationship very seriously. You know, you're still, you're so young at that age. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that because during the relationship, since we were, since we were so young, I had always said to myself, like I talked myself out of the fact that I was in a toxic relationship. I'm like, I physically can't be in a toxic relationship because I'm so young. This doesn't happen when you're young. And I kind of like used my age to almost like be ignorant or naive to what was really happening. And especially with being in, in this relationship from 14 to 17, that was a third of my life at that point. And those are, were extremely formative years between going all through this, the high school, going through college, like turning 21 when you really get into becoming an adult in those formative years. And so um, I think that because of the fact that I was young, I tried to almost justify what was happening and really downplay everything. And it wasn't until probably a year or two after the relationship ended when I really had time to sit and reflect on it and think about it. And I was like, wow, that was dramatic going through that and everything that was happening and really just understanding what was going on. But you're right, Jenny. I mean, going through that relationship at a young age, people are people just chalk it up to young love. And so they don't really take into the consideration the fact that it could be really serious. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk about your mom for a little bit. So tell us about your mom. 
So my mom, I feel like it's so funny. Whenever I talk about her, I always say, no matter how much I try to describe her, it'll never do justice the type of person she was. Like she was just one of those people that brought sunshine. And so we ended up losing her after two and a half years of her battle with brain cancer. Um, But one of the things that I say that I feel like could really describe who she is or get as close to I can about it is that as she was going through this very difficult um, illness and just juggling everything and whatnot, her phrase would always say, it could be worse. And I'm like, mom, you literally are going through terminal brain cancer. It could not be worse than that. But it's just exactly who she was, always had a smile on her face, was always thinking of what can I do for other people? Never what can I do for myself? She was an extremely hard worker. She was an x-ray tech at a hospital for 40 years and was extremely well-loved by her colleagues and doctors that worked with her. And a lot of the qualities that she had, I hope that I've absorbed some of them and have worked them into my own life by always looking for positivity and finding ways that I can help people and also taking her empathy, which she was very empathetic to people. And I hope that that's that's something that I've um, gotten passed down to me as well. Well, I would say so. I think that just by knowing you in our community, yes. And you, like I said, I, before we started recording, you are definitely a ray of sunshine and, and, you know, it's, your energy is so beautiful and so welcoming and inclusive. So for sure on that, was there a connection between her job and the cancer? People were wondering that because of the radiation from the x-ray and having her brain cancer, but there was never any link that we could find. But it's ironic that you mentioned that because that was a big thought that we had right when her diagnosis first happened. Yeah, I was wondering that. So you were, how old were you when she was going through that? She was diagnosed the day after my 19th birthday, and then she passed away when I was about 21 and a half. So just if you could talk about that experience a little bit of being very young and, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, so what's the, what's the rest of your family structure like, like just generally speaking? Yes. So I am a family of girls. I have a twin sister and two older sisters. So my dad definitely had his hands full. Um, But during the, when she was sick, I actually didn't live at school. I lived at home. And so my twin sister was in college in Connecticut My two older sisters were were working full-time and also in their own apartments, and my dad was working full-time as well. So what ultimately ended up happening was I ended up becoming her caretaker, ultimately, between going to school full-time, running my business um, during the first year of my business, so probably between 19 to 20. I was also working at a coffee shop and babysitting and taking care of my mom and trying to have like a normal life. So there was just like so much going on. About a year into her diagnosis, so right after I turned 20, um, she had a stroke. And so that stroke left her with very little use of her left arm and a little bit of use of her right arm. And it did leave her tied to a wheelchair. So with that, there was a lot of different responsibilities that had to come with that because it's a lot of physical labor and care. And so we were very grateful to have had so many family friends and family members who would come visit every single day while my dad was at work and while I was at school to kind of sit and keep her company and whatnot. But it was a lot to ask someone, hey, can you physically take care of Terry? And so what that entailed for me was every morning I would go and get her up out of bed, had to move her from her bed to her wheelchair wheelchair her into the bathroom, help her as she uses the bathroom, uh, help her get into the shower, have her sit in that chair in the shower, physically get in the shower myself and shower her, and then help her down the stairs to get her comfy. So sometimes um, because she was so weak, she was able to kind of walk down, but most of the time I actually physically picked her up and carried her down the stairs. And so I'm 5'1". I'm a very small, petite person. And so that was one thing my dad always said was like, I don't know how you do it. Like, you're just so little. And I'm like, you would do anything for the people that you love. And so it was just a lot of emotional labor in addition to the physical stuff that was going on. And so it was just a lot to manage that and just kind of not take what I was going through at home into my schoolwork or into my business and kind of make sure that I'm juggling everything. But it's it's really hard not to have that intersection, like everything overlaps or intertwines. And so it was just a lot to go through. That's a very like, how has that changed you fundamentally? I mean, the the experience of having your mother be be not well and and be sick, but then also just the caretaking, that's a really big undertaking. And 
for a young woman who's also going through her own shit, right? Who's going through the toxic relationship. I, I just wonder if how that fundamentally has changed you and your outlook. Yeah, I say now I have such a different perspective on life than I did back then. Like truly, I do not sweat the small stuff. And that's one thing that I've kind of learned to understand as I go through life because there are so many bigger problems happening. An example of that would be when my mom had her stroke that was Um, during my sophomore year of college. And it actually happened right before our spring break. And so during that spring break, I spent uh, the entire break, obviously, visiting her her at rehab every day. And I remember getting back to school after break, and it was March, and it was actually snowing, which is typical Massachusetts weather. And I remember sitting in my economics class, and everyone around me was like, oh, I can't believe we came back to snow after they were just in Mexico and Aruba and Punta Cana. And I'm like, I just came back from visiting my mom in rehab for a week after she had a stroke. And you're sitting here complaining that you came back to snow after spending seven days in hot weather. And so just that situation kind of made me realize that there's so many more important problems going on in life. And when something seems difficult or seems frustrating, it really kind of gives me a reality check. And I'm like, it could be so much worse to quote my mom, it could be worse. And so that's one thing that I've really adjusted is that I definitely don't take for granted what I have in life, because I know what it's like to have had something that you loved so much taken away from you. Did, did that feel very isolating as a young woman to, to be going through this, this huge, like, um, like you said, emotional, physical, mental, I mean, you were taking care of your dying mother, right? That Did that feel isolating? It did. And it also was exhausting to that point as well. I mean, no one really understood what I was going through, especially being so young, 19, 20, 21 years old, and also growing a business at that time. I mean, starting a business while young is not normal, quote unquote, either. And so people don't get that aspect as well. And so it felt very difficult to go through that. Um, I say fortunately, unfortunately, I kind of like to use those words together, but my best friend did lose her mom to cancer when we were 16. So I was grateful for the fact that we have that connection, although I wish we didn't have to have a connection like that, but she was someone who understood. And even though we were five years age difference between her mom passing away and my mom passing away, there were so many similarities. And I knew that if I were to text her or just need someone to be there for me, it was so great to know that she was that person who could do that. But ultimately, you're right, Olivia, it was extremely isolating just knowing that there were so many things going on when college is supposed to be about partying and meeting friends and making core memories. And that was just not the experience that I had. I have a question and you don't have to answer this. I can cut it out. But did you resent your sisters for not being the one that was there every day with her? No. So they were there in different capacities and complementary capacities. So I would never hold it against them that they did have full-time jobs that prevented them, as well as my twin sister who was physically away at school. So um, one of my sisters worked from home every Friday so that she could be there for my mom, which is amazing. My other sister did a lot of the cooking. She was a school teacher, and so she's an amazing cook. And so she'd come home from work and then cook us dinner and make sure that was all set. And then my twin sister is a nurse. So it was very, very helpful when she was home from school and on breaks to have her to take my mom to appointments and do more of like the medical care that was needed. And most importantly, understand and interpret what the doctors were telling us and being able to kind of have that lingo ultimately incorporated into it. And so I feel like all four of us between the different capabilities that we did all pulled weight in all different ways. And so it was nice to have a family of six of us um, who are really there for one another and really put differences aside or put any stresses aside to be there for my mom. Yeah, I know. I love that. How do you as a family celebrate your mom and honor her now? So today is actually her birthday with the, um, yes, the day of the recording. So what we do each year is we actually plan a dinner where we get together and we end up celebrating her birthday, usually going to one of her favorite places. We also um, love to, during like her anniversary of her passing, also go out to dinner together and celebrate. And then I feel like between all of us, whenever we're together, like 
just for functions or just even hanging out, the co- the topic of our mom always comes up. Like something will happen, it'll trigger a memory. And we're like, oh, remember when mom did this? Or remember when mom said that? And it's just like, we don't even need to kind of work to keep her alive, like or her memory alive. It just naturally happens. Like yeah. she was just someone who made such an impact on us that I feel like we naturally are always thinking about her, always talking about her, always appreciating all of the memories that she brought. Happy birthday, Terry! First of all, that's so <laughs> Thank I love you. that. That's, that's beautiful. Um, how do you? How, so, I just want to talk about grief for a second. Like, you know, grief culturally, we still are not talking about it, and this is something we talk about a lot on our podcast, as you know. So, what's that like to lose your mom so young, and then you're building a business, you're dating, you're meeting your fiance? How how does that like? we talk a lot about how when you're grieving, the world keeps spinning on and you're like Mm -hmm. screaming, my mom just died. Right. So what was that like that experience to carry this grief with you, especially in those early days? Yeah, it was definitely difficult. I would say that I was very transparent about what I was going through, especially towards the end of her life. All of my clients at the time knew what was happening. And so they were the best during that time. Like I couldn't have asked for better clients who were more supportive and understanding. And for me, I just kind of realized to listen to myself. Like I'm someone who is always go, 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 go. And I kind of just tried to push myself to continue working through things. But it made me realize there there was just going to be random days where I woke up and I just wasn't feeling it. And I was just feeling sad. And instead of forcing myself to sit there and work through it, I had to kind of honor what my body and what my mind was telling me and just kind of take a break and do something for myself. And so it kind of forced me to almost slow down a bit. I used to kind of just push through and work through and almost get to the point where I wasn't thinking about what was happening, but just kind of giving myself some grace and understanding that it might come out of the blue and that's how grief is. It's up and down and just knowing that if it does happen, that it's okay to take a step back and take some moments for yourself. What would you say to somebody who is losing a parent? We have a friend who just lost their dad, like, you know, at a, at a young age, you know, that when it's kind of, I'm going to use the term like unnatural, right? At that age to lose your parent, what would, what would be something you could say to them? I would say never stop talking about them. I feel like people worry, or at least I did. I feel like people, or I worried that people would feel uncomfortable with the fact that I was bringing her up so much. Like people get very not like weird, but they don't know how to respond almost to stuff like that. They don't know whether to say sorry. They don't, they just don't know what to say is really what it comes down to, which is a great reason why your book exists, by the way. (laughs) So (laughs) um, people just don't know how to respond to it. So I'd say, don't worry about what other people are thinking, like always keep their memory alive. I will also say to make sure that you have non-negotiables in your life. So always make sure that there's at least one thing that you do for yourself every single day in some form of self-care. So for me, that's running. I run every morning. For me, that's reading. As as we mentioned earlier in this episode, I love to read. Making sure that you're taking time to just do the things that fill up your cup and make you happy because although grief can be very unpredictable, you still need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and making sure that you're supported in any way possible. I love that. So I want to switch gears for a second. You are an entrepreneur. And you have multiple businesses. So I would love to hear just quickly, like how, you know, the social media agency came about and then really how you have launched the Massachusetts Business Network, which I've seen now grow exponentially over the last couple of years. Absolutely. So my marketing agency, Dash of Social, I started it um, just over seven years ago in 2016. But I'm someone who's always been very entrepreneurial minded. So since a young age, I used to pretend that I own businesses. I used to love the idea of being a business owner. I was obsessed with buying office supplies. Like I just knew right from the start that I was going to own a business one day. Mm -hmm. I just never knew what it would be. I'm also someone who, of course, loves to read and write. And so it was very natural for me to start a blog during my sophomore year of high school, which was just over 10 years ago in 2012. And so I spent hours and hours each week, probably at least 10 to 15, working on this blog. And I suddenly had a realization where I was like, wait a second, if I'm going to spend all of this time on this blog each week, basically treat it like a part-time job, then I need to make sure that not just my family knows about it and is reading it. And I need to find somehow find a way to get some type of return from it. And so I wanted to really achieve two goals. One, reach the right audience. And two, monetize it. And so when thinking about what I could do to make that happen, that's when I realized that marketing and then ultimately social media came to mind. 
So I taught myself how to use social media from a business standpoint, because of course, I'd only used it personally from that point and beyond. And so I taught myself how to use social media, marketed in my blog, grew my readership, became like a micro influencer, and then realized that marketing was something that I really enjoyed. So it naturally led me into the world of freelancing just from the relationships that I had built in that blogging community. And I realized it was something that I was really excited about and really passionate about, which gave me this aha moment where I was like, I want to own a marketing agency one day. But at that point, since I was only about, uh, it was actually a senior in high school when I first started freelancing. So like 17, 18 wow. years old, I kind of felt like society places a predetermined path for us at a young age where we're expected to go to school, get a degree, build up a successful 20 plus year career, and then we could go and start a business. I feel like things have changed now since the pandemic, but that was really what I felt like was my expect expected of me at that age. I didn't think that I could just start a business right off the gate. But then, of course, it was my mom's diagnosis that made me realize life is short. We don't have as much time as we think we do to pursue our dreams and follow the things that we feel passionate about. So we might as well do it now. And then that's when I ended up starting Dash of Social was um, about eight months after her diagnosis in September 2016. And it has, without a doubt, been, a, been one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah, you're very successful. I mean, you you work with a lot of clients and we we can't wait to hire you to take over our <laughs> social. Um, and then where did the Massachusetts Business Network idea come from? Yeah, so that's been more of like a passion project I call for myself. So I've always loved all things small business, local business, and entrepreneurship. And when the pandemic happened, I was grateful for the fact that my marketing agency exploded in yeah. the work that we were doing because people needed us as they were transitioning their services and businesses online. But I saw firsthand from many clients that I worked with and many business owners that I knew the negative impact and horrible impact that it had on their businesses. And so I wanted to find a way to support them through this process by giving them some type of like free visibility or connection or community, whatever it might be. But I'm very guilty of overcommitting myself to things. And I feel excited about it. I don't really let it sit. I just do it. And then I get to the point where I'm like, oh, shoot, I have way too much on my plate right now. And so I kind of force myself to sit and think about it and make sure it was something that I actually wanted to do. So Massachusetts Business Network, the idea of it came in 2020. But as you mentioned earlier, Liv, it wasn't until 2022 when I actually started it. Because I realized that I couldn't stop thinking about that idea. And I said, if I can't stop thinking about it, it means I need to do it. And so Massachusetts Business Network officially started in November 2022. And we're a visibility publication that focuses on providing brand awareness, education, connections, and communities to organizations across the state. So we have a blog that people can write for. We have a podcast that they can be guests on. We attend monthly lunch and learns on a variety of topics that they can attend. And we also have a business directory where they can list their business and hope to get found through their contact information. So this has really just been something that I feel very excited about. I mean, I make like a very small amount of money per year, maybe honestly $100 if I'm being totally transparent. But it's just something that I genuinely love doing. And just the amount of feedback that I've gotten from people who have been a part of it has validated the amount of time that I've put into it because it's a labor of love and just hearing how much it is supported people and benefited people is absolutely what keeps me going every day. No, I think it's it's amazing. And I think I honestly think you're just getting started with it. I could see it going national too. I think that, yeah. you know, there there is, you know, we're on Long Island, obviously, but there is such a lack of community for small businesses. Like, even if I go try to find, a, you know, a directory of small businesses, there's nothing. And I've, I've yeah. iterated over those kind of similar thoughts that you've had, but you do it so beautifully. And Many of our experts work with you over there and the Massachusetts Business Network, and uh, it's it's awesome. But I, I truly think that that is going to blow up over the next couple of years. And you clearly are somebody that has wonderful ideas and executes them beautifully. And, uh, you know, it's just it's such a joy to watch somebody and, you know, be so passionate about something and make it happen. But also you have so much like that empathy and that, you know, you're doing this not to make money, right? You're doing this because you genuinely want small businesses to be seen and heard and connect people. And that that is going to be successful because of the passion that you put into it. I hope it, so. so. That's so kind of you to say thank you. And it's funny that you mentioned going nationally because someone asked me, they're like, 
do you ever think you'd make like a New Hampshire business network? I'm like, maybe, maybe I could franchise out the idea. You never know. <laughs> I mean, that's how a lot of people do this. You know, there's a lot yeah. of different kind of things like that. And I think it's, you know, you at the helm would definitely be very successful. So I, we're just so excited to watch you as you keep going and, you know, keep giving us those book reviews. Um, so Ashley, if somebody is going through a fresh start, what would be some wise words that you can impart to them? Surround yourself with people who will be there for you. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, going through all those different things that I had going on, I can't even imagine where I would be if I didn't have the family members, the friends to lean on and really be that shoulder to cry on as I was going through the difficulties. Not only the shoulder to cry on, but also my biggest cheerleader. So they were there to celebrate my wins with me and pick me up when, when things were really down. And so I think it's crucial to have those people that you know are dependable and who do exactly what you need them to do during the time that you're going through or the right things to say. And so I'm so grateful to have had that support because like I mentioned, I don't know what would have happened if I just felt truly alone and didn't have people in my life that I felt like I could lean on. I love that. And before we go on to the last question, you're getting married. Can you tell us a little bit about the wedding? Because you've been sharing a little bit, but I'd love to to hear more. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm getting married in a little over a year as of the date of this recording. It'll be October 13th, 2024. We're getting married at this beautiful farm barn type of venue in Western Mass called Valley View Farm. And I had found that venue because I had this very specific idea of what I wanted in a venue. I wanted like a farm barn type of venue, but all the ones down here on the South Shore of Massachusetts are a little bit too rustic, a little bit too dark. I wanted something light and bright and airy. Mm. So I came across Valley View um, through Google, I think it was. And I think my jaw dropped. I was like, I am obsessed with this place. And I said to Jeremy, my fiance, I was like, if I feel the same exact way when we step on these grounds, like that's it. It's a done deal. (laughs) And so it ended up happening. We never even looked at anywhere else. I was just in love with it. But it's been so fun to go through the wedding planning process. A bit difficult knowing that I don't have my mom with me, but I do have a really supportive and loving future mother-in-law who has really done a lot and that I'm grateful for in that sense. But it's been exciting to have something to look forward to. And going through my other three sisters' weddings, I'm happy that it's finally my turn. (laughs) Yeah, we didn't even... um... We didn't even get into the. I want to, you know, hear more next time you come on to talk about what being a twin is like because yeah. I, I have questions about that. How are you going to honor your mom at the wedding? So my second oldest sister Chelsea did a beautiful tribute at her wedding that I think I'm going to do something similar for, where she had one of all five of us favorite pictures of my mom up. She had a candle lit next to it. And she had actually written a poem about my mom, about the sentiment of her um, smile is shining through the sun that's coming through, like just very beautiful words. And I thought that was really nicely done. My other sister, Brittany, also did a really great idea where instead of doing favors, um, she had actually, her and her husband, Johnny, had actually donated money to Mass General, where my mom was getting treatment. So in lieu of favors, they donated money in her name, which I thought was also a nice touch. And so I feel like I'll probably do something similar, definitely having photos of her. And, and I'm sure that she'll be brought up uh, plenty of times throughout the night with my dad's speech and everything else. I love that. What was your mom's favorite food? She loved anything chocolate. So it's so funny. We used to joke that she would always have a chocolate stash, but it was never secret because we all knew where it was. Um, One of my favorite memories of her is when she was sick, I had Reese's, which is my favorite chocolate, and I hid them under my bed so that she couldn't find them because she was known for always snooping out people's chocolates. Mm -hmm. I get home from work one day and I see her sitting on my bed eating my Reese's. And I'm like, mom, those are my Reese's. (laughs) It was just, it was so funny. It was just something that she was always known for just having a super sweet tooth. I love that. I love that. So what was the last thing that you ate recently and loved? Everything bagel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So good. I am a very big bagel fan. I have one every single morning. I just can't not have it. (laughs) I I love that. that. 
Well, um, Ashley, thank you for sharing all of that. I think your story is so important. You know, there are so many people who lose parents young and Mm -hmm. it does change the trajectory of your life. And I think that we don't talk about that enough. So we're so proud of you for everything that you do and keep shining, keep doing what you're doing. We're excited to work with you someday. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you just have such a beautiful, beautiful energy and personality and the, the energy you put into the world. I'm not surprised that you're attracting awesome people to come work with you because that's who you are and so just keep that up and we're so excited about your wedding and just thank you for just your authenticity always you know whether it's on twitter or in a podcast or you just do such a beautiful job at lifting people up you've been a huge fan of us and and our podcast and we adore you for that and we're so grateful so thank you for being here Yeah, thank you both so much for having me. I didn't mention this earlier in the show, but this is actually the first time that I've publicly talked about that relationship. And so in that aspect, I'm very grateful to have had the platform that provides the comfort and confidence to help me do so. Well, we're happy to have you here. And I think that as always, your story is so important because, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, high school romances are I think incredibly important because they inform a lot of your future relationships and they can be wonderful, but they can be heartbreaking and they can also, you know, teach you a lot. So we appreciate you sharing. Thank you for listening to today's story. We're always here and we're proud of you. A Fresh Story is produced by Fresh Starts Registry, the first and only platform for everything you need to begin again. You can read the show notes and learn more about today's episode at afreshstory.com. As always, we want to remind our listeners that while we strive to provide accurate and helpful information, we are not medical doctors or mental health professionals. We want to remind you all that the information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for professional advice. We highly recommend consulting a qualified healthcare or mental health professional for any concerns or questions you may have. Remember, we are a podcast, but we are not licensed medical professionals. Always consult with your healthcare provider for any medical decisions. And as a gentle reminder, all opinions are our guests and do not necessarily reflect our own.